Welcome to Policy and Politics with me, Tarun Nangia. Commerce Minister Piyush Goel last week in an address in the city of London said that work is on in full speed for finalizing the free trade agreement between India and United Kingdom. This is indeed going to be a landmark step in the Commerce Ministership of Minister Piyush Goel on the one hand, but on the other hand, of India's relations with United Kingdom under the Prime Ministership of Narendra Modi. That is why we discussed this issue today. And we have three eminent individuals who will join us on this. Uh, I have with me Ambassador Jain Das Gupta. He was India's ambassador to the World Trade Organization. I have with me Rohan Shah. He's an advocate practicing in the High Court and the Supreme Court of India, and also uh, 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 Bombay High Court, Delhi High Court, and the Supreme Court. Also, he's India's governor representative to Iria from the Commerce Ministry. I have with me Mohit Saraf. He's managing partner of Saraf and Partners, one of India's leading law firms. And at the outset, may I first request uh, Ambassador Das Gupta in about the next two and a half, three minutes to lay the ground before we move on for what is in preparations for this FTA? Uh, UK and India are uh, natural FTA partners because the UK has about 80% of its GDP coming from services, uh, about 15% uh, or so from manufacturing, and approximately 5% or less uh, people uh, have calculated it at about 3-4% from agriculture. On the other hand, if you look at India, our uh, contribution to the GDP from agriculture is about 16-17%. From industrial uh, manufacturing, it is another 17-18%. About 55% of our GDP comes from services. But mostly from domestic trading uh, services, construction, and uh, other services which are normally not exported. The export part of India's services is uh, basically about information technology, information technology enabled services, professional and consulting services, and travel related services. Whereas the UK's exports in services is uh, focused on fintech on uh, a broad range of financial services, uh, including insurance, uh, which is uh, non-life insurance, for instance, maritime insurance, Lloyd's, as you know, is a very major player in the global market, has been for many decades. So uh, the, uh, the uh, complementarities of the two economies that India with the Make in India program, Atma Nirbhar Bharat program, is poised to have a, uh, to broaden its base in manufacturing, produce more and more sophisticated products, which will be geared to meet the requirements of uh, not only middle income countries, but uh, developed countries. We are also broadening our base in the services export sector. And uh, we, in a few areas, for instance, healthcare, in uh, cyber security, in uh, defense related uh, activities, there is uh, a scope, immense scope for cooperation. The last point I wanted to mention is that India is the second largest investor in the UK coming after the US. The UK is the sixth largest investor in India uh, after uh, five other countries, including, of course, uh, the US, Singapore, uh, Mauritius, and so on. So in terms of investments, there is a, a, an immense scope for bilateral cooperation and two-way investment flows. On services, there is a scope for exploiting the, the synergies which are available. And in trade in goods, the UK is increasingly looking to diversify, diversify its uh, import basket from a mainly China-oriented one and a European Union-oriented one to uh, uh, one which is uh, you know, spread 
uh, more or less uh, uniformly over the rest of the globe. Thank you. Thank you for that opening comment. I'll go across to Advocate Rohan Shah. You are, uh, in a sense, working with the Commerce Ministry as their representative. So could you share with us what are we headed to? How important is this FTA with United Kingdom? Tarun, I think two very important factors that we need to look at is the point in time that you know we are talking about this FTA. In the context of UK, quite clearly, this is the post-Brexit UK. Uh, it is going through some sort of uh, soul-searching in terms of its own trade position. Uh, there have been unprecedented crises in UK about you know certain parts of their economic system uh, where they are now looking for support. So, for example... If you look at the retail industry in the UK, you look at the hospitality industry in the UK, uh, there is just a complete absence of service staff, right? And it's not easy to find English speaking service uh, staff, you know, all over the world. There are few pockets where you can get it. Uh, so it's a UK in some form of transition. Uh, and it's a India in clearly a phase of transition where our credibility internationally as a large, the world's largest democracy, as a credible trading partner, we certainly don't have the baggage of China, we don't have the baggage of Russia. And for UK, it's important that they find replacements to the sort of imports that they were getting in from China, that they were getting in from Russia. And uh, so we sort of provide that uh, large manufacturing base and credible manufacturing base. So as I said, in the life of both countries, this is an important inflection point. And I think a very important part of the chemistry that Minister Goyal spoke of is that when this negotiation began, it really began as trying to identify some sort of uh, early harvest products and services that you know we could work with before we reached a full-fledged FTA to start showcasing benefits on both sides. But uh, the nature of the negotiation, and I think the chemistry in the negotiation has really got us to a stage where uh, now uh, both sides are very positively affirming that we could have an FTA by Diwali. And uh, you know that, I think, shows the immense uh, a uh, chemistry which is built, but also the economic need. Because currently, uh, if we compare uh, the, the trade that we have with the UK, uh, I think everyone recognizes that there is exponential opportunity for both countries. And if you see one of the reports which has come from the international trade body uh, in uh, UK, you know they have clearly identified their ambition. And if you see it, Widespread. It goes from food and beverages to, uh, you know, to equipment and machinery, to medical devices, to pharmaceutical uh, products. So they have a widish ambition. And one of the areas of interest is that for the first time, India in the UAE FTA, we've opened up the door a little in the context of public procurement. And I think that, again, is an area of interest. For public us... Uh, of course, the opportunities are massive in terms of export of goods, export of services. And, you know, we normally are in an endeavor always to get better access in terms of movement of natural persons. Well, I, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, uh, sorry, the natural persons is what you said. Basically, uh, human resources export is what we would mean. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you were, you were saying something. Well, I, I wanted to come in from the point that India has emerged as one of the largest investors in the United Kingdom. We saw the Tatas investing in the past decade. Uh, then there was investment from Vedanta. There were some other promoters who invested. Of late, we hear that Reliance Industries Limited also is planning a big investment in that country. Uh, do you think that also shows the nature of the relationship two countries has been having where Indians have emerged as a large investor in that country? So two aspects to it. I mean, you know... Uh, India being a powerhouse investor 
is a more recent phenomena of the last 15 years. Previously, there was always this sense that we were looking for FDI. We were not potential FDI investors. Now, uh, certainly, there have been the Tatas, there have been the Vedantas. You know, the Mittals are based there, the Hindujas are based there. Their businesses are there. They are major contributors to the economy. They are of Indian origin. Obviously, they have a leaning towards India as well. So I think uh, the understanding sort of effectively is that, you know, not only is India potentially going to be a large investor, uh, there is also the recognition that the Indian investment, when it sort of comes in, typically is an investment which creates hard assets and hard jobs. Uh, and from that perspective, the scale of that investment uh, is something which is, I think, definitely of ongoing interest in UK. And there are synergies where we could benefit from, uh, you know, investments from them ongoing equally. They could benefit from us. And quite honestly, you know, you, you look at now all the listings of the super rich and uh, the super impactful. And it's hard to ignore where Mr. Ambani stands and where Mr. Adani stands and where many of the others stands because they are going to be the key investors of the future in different parts of the world. And I don't think that's a fact also which is lost on the UK. That's a, that's a very good point. I'll go to Mohit Saraf, managing partner Saraf and Partners. Now, we hear your name always in some sort of an M&A deal, be it uh, between America and India, some other deals. If you could also speak from the law firm's perspective and what do you see, uh, uh, where are we headed with this FTA with UK that Commerce Minister Piyush Goel spoke about? Last few years, I would say there has been a major shift in global trading interests. Countries are realigning their interests and negotiating FTAs. I think that's an important trend. I think that Mr. Das Gupta mentioned about complementarity between India and UK, and Rohan also emphasized on that. But I think the important thing is that countries are negotiating the FTA based on their mutual requirement. And absolutely, the big challenge and the big change is obviously COVID. And, and seclusion, in a way, the world started moving away from globalization post-COVID. Uh, right from the Trump era, you've seen regional blocks and regional trade barriers being imposed. Now, Indi and the Indo-Pacific area is becoming far more important, both for the US and for UK. And therefore, this is an important change which is bringing in. China plus one, Art Nirbhar, and complementarity of the service industry, because what UK does and what we do is very different. And therefore, this is an absolutely, I would say, there is a perfect synthesis between the two nations, provided they can negotiate FTA well. And as what Das Gupta ji said, that we are one of the larger investors in UK, and therefore, our investment needs to be protected. Vice versa, their investment needs to be protected because they're also fifth largest invested investor in India. And intellectual property, fintech, all those areas. So I would say right now, it's uh, uh, the, the, the government, what I understood from Mr. Piyush Goyal, that what the government is thinking about is that they will do a two-step two process. First, they will attack the low-hanging fruit and at least get started because... Well, UK is in a way isolated post Brexit, and therefore they need Indian uh, an FTA agreement quite desperately. That also will Im improve its position in the Indo Pacific region. And also, I would say this is an important thing because we, right now, if you look at our India UK trade, it's just mere $16 billion. And they are talking about $100 billion by 2030. So this is a, a large scheme. And therefore, it is important because if you look at last two years, what the government has done, they brought specialized trade organization. You know that I'm very active with FIKI. FIKI has been very closely involved with the UAE and Australia. So they are getting business people to get involved because when RCEP was there, everybody felt in the industry and FIKI, that the entire supply chain in India was compromised. So this is a big opportunity, and Mr. Goel is picking up that opportunity, making sure that the trade relationship benefits India 
And I'm sure that is the same reason why UK e exited uh, the European Union. So this is an important complementarity and this will go a long way. If the both countries work together, they negotiate hard, and then what they negotiate, they make sure that it gets done. Because I think the world has changed dramatically on data localization, intellectual property rights. There's so many new things which the trade relationship and FTA covers, clean energy. So therefore, this is an important part. This needs to be done uh, over next year. I think we are happy that at least by, the, by Diwali, hopefully we'll have an interim solution to the FTA. On this note, I'll take a short break and be right back. Welcome back. Just before the break, we had Mohit Saraf explaining to us the benefits that will accrue from the India and United Kingdom free trade agreement. Now, I'll go to Rohan Shah for his inputs on the give and take that will happen. Do you think we uh, the next three, four months, we'll see extensive promoter meetings in the Ministry of Commerce where they will give their list of demands of what to concede in the FTA, what is going to impact them, what we should be expecting from them, do you think this is something that goes on for the next uh, four, five, five, six months? Yeah. So, you know, the one thing which I think has typified our negotiations over the last at least year and a half, or even a little more, is that Minister Goyal and team, I think, have had extensive interactions with Indian industry and across the board. And I think that has been the one major change in the factor that our uh, negotiations now resonate the concerns of industry. Whereas earlier, probably, you know, the sense was they're quite bureaucratic in terms of our negotiation. Then, then when we present it to industry, there is dissatisfaction and we spend a lot of time trying to unscramble uh, what has been done. And, you know, then you get trade remedial measures, anti-dumping, safeguards, you know, different things. So, uh, yes, this is a far more consultative phase, uh, but one has to sort of, of course, understand that, you know, when it comes to the commerce minister or his team, uh, in the individual industries will always say that their issue is the most important. But when you do a trade negotiation, obviously you have to align national priorities with individual industry priorities, and you have to align on uh, those issues of where you have a dependence, which is an import dependence, and how you can strengthen your export opportunity. So having taken the input of industry, uh, the role of a negotiator, in our case, our commerce minister or you know commerce secretary and others, is not just to sort of project what Indian industry wants. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they do that and do that very skillfully. But you ultimately have to strike a balance and not everyone who gives you a viewpoint, you know, can be translated into a win-win negotiating position for Indian industry alone. Because obviously there is somebody negotiating on the UK side who also wants some wins. And, you know, one of those issues has typically been, you know, between India, EU, India, UK. In the context of alcoholic beverages, you know, our, our duty is very high. And, you know, we have had issues where we would like, for example, our whiskey to be able to access their markets. But, you know, they have some sort of uh, situation of classification where they believe that, you know, it is only green whiskey and, you know, not, not something which comes from molasses, which can be called whiskey. Now, this is just an example of the many such negotiations that we will have to have. Uh, there are some where very clearly there is... Uh, a situation where they have a strength and we have a need. Equally, there are many areas where we have strengths and they have a need. Those are much easier to set off one against the other. But then there are situations where there will jointly be needs and you know they will want to sort of address it in a certain manner. So we have, of course, I would think a very high ambition on iron and steel products, aluminium, cement. Uh, but increasingly, there is an aspect which is coming in which is an environmental aspect and, you know, which is re referred to as this whole carbon border adjustment mechanism, where the nations like UK are bringing in an aspect to say 
that if your industry pollutes more than a certain standard, then they must buy carbon credits before their goods, our goods can go into their national border, which really means that it places a huge and unnatural burden on us. And also world over, this is critique because the developing nations are now having to pay this burden, whereas the developed nations burden the world with this environmental uh, crisis. And now they are sitting pretty, asking developing nations, why will you not comply? So it's a vexed issue. I don't think they are simple answers. <laughs> and I think that's the whole beauty of the international trade negotiation, that there are some very easy wins for both sides. But there are also contentious issues. And how you get over them is what creates the larger trade opportunity. And I think, I mean, kudos to our minister and kudos to his team. I think they've done remarkably. Uh, you know, we've already done the UAE, we've done Australia. We seem to be on the cusp of UK, Canada. Uh, we have something going at speed also with the US. So I think that dynamic of consulting industry is critical, but not everything can be delivered because the negotiation cannot be that India wins everything. That's, no, that's a fair I'm point to make. And I think we, a lot. that's a fair point to make. I think by October, we will at least get to uh, do a show or two on specific industries uh, which uh, which matter to India yeah. as well as... Uh, so, Karun, my, my only last point was that the one thing, of course, is while it's always tough and difficult, I, I think we are winning far more uh, than we were ever in the past. And that is partly the stature India now has as a manufacturing and services nation. And also, I think, you know, that we have a much better uh, defined negotiating policy uh, and approach uh, under Minister Goel. That, thanks thanks for making that point. I'll go to Mohit Sarah for his point on the issues that we will face. And secondly, the opportunities on the MA and and other side, because FTA means a floodgates open for investment also. Uh, uh, how do you see that happening? I would say Indians... Otherwise, also, I think going to Africa, UK is an important base for outward investment into UK. Africa goes to UK. So India, m &A into UK will always be a big factor. English investments into India will also be a big factor. There will not be too many m &As into India. But going forward with appropriate FTA and appropriate investment, protection. I don't see that going away and that will only strengthen further and also because UK, India is becoming very important in the Indo-Pacific region because of the China plus, because of Brexit. So India will obviously be a trading partner and investment partner. But having said that, I would say what the way I look at it is the difference in how things are shaping today is that in historical way, we often never consulted. We did not even know what is going to benefit us, what will not benefit us. And we and we and this was done in an isolation, away from the general from a trade body, because generally it was believed that we will get our wisdom or our, our, our independence of the government will get compromised if they are discussing too much. Today, I think the change scenario is that yes, the government is sitting and discussing with the trade body, which again, I would say, they are just getting equal. <laughs> this was always done by most sophisticated nation. It's nothing new, nothing great, except that it's a change in trajectory. What we did not do for last 20 years, but all our trading partners were doing it. Today, if you see the RCEP, the, the, the way Vietnam benefited, we did not benefit. Our industry, our supply chain got totally uh, spoiled. So therefore, this is important. This is a new trend, which is, I would say, it's a trend we should have done 20 years back. But having said that, it's better late than, than never. But what is more important is that more discussion, obviously, in any negotiation, you have to give and take. So obviously, you need to go prepared about your industry. You need to know how big or important is this industry in, in UK export. So you should know what you need and you should know what they require. And having said that, you obviously have to have give and take because really at, at the end of the day, legal industry opening up is a big issue for UK. So I would say some of these things will come up 
And I, I would say give and take has to happen, but we need to make sure that this benefits eventually India. And I'm sure English counterpart will do the same for their country. Moving on to Ambassador Jain Das Gupta for his uh, intervention. Well, uh, I uh, have a slightly contrary point of view to uh, what Mr. Saraf mentioned. It has been long been the practice of the Commerce Ministry, and since I was also involved in FTA negotiations, to intensively consult with the stakeholders. And uh, just to name a few associations, CII, FICI, ASOCHAM, hundreds of meetings used to be held, not only with the main bodies, but with industry-specific bodies of these uh, organizations. Consultations used to be held with states, with uh, bodies in particular states, which used to represent a large part of our uh, domestic industry. One of the major problems uh, was that because of the high tariffs that we used to maintain till about 15 years ago, our industry was quite sanguine that nothing would come to threaten them. So they were not really bothered about export opportunities, barring in a few sectors, like apparel, like leather, et cetera. So that is the change that has really come about. So this is the nuance that I would like to put into these uh, uh, discussions. The point that uh, Mr. Saraf and Mr. Rohan Shah have made are very well taken. There would have to be give and take. Each industry, if you talk to, for instance, the apparel industry, they will say, please give us uh, zero duty access to uh, the UK, but don't give uh, you know, much access to the UK to export to us and so on and so forth. So ultimately, this balancing act, which is a really tightrope walk, this is what is the most difficult part of an FTA negotiation. And the minister, not only the minister, the cabinet gets into this. Uh, and uh, the ultimately, it is uh, at the highest level that a decision is taken, as it was in the case of the RCEP. Now, uh, you know, there are a few areas. Uh, Scotch whiskey was mentioned, so I must... Uh, uh, you know, mention a few things about the Scotch whiskey uh, issue. All alcoholic beverages coming to India under the normal trade route, you know, barring the one which we have just signed with uh, Australia, where there is a graded tariff reduction. So if it is up to $5, you know, you charge so much for a bottle of wine, if it is between 5 and $15 and so on. Otherwise, it is 150%. That is the duty which is charged at the customs. And on top of that, whatever is charged by way of state excise duty is also levied once the uh, alcoholic beverage enters a particular state. Many states have brought it down to very low levels. That is another matter. Now, the Scotch Whiskey Association has been saying, Mr. Kent uh, is their secretary, that they have a share of only 2% of our uh, market. They would like to raise it to, buy, uh, to about 6%, which is about three times. And they would like to uh, get the duties reduced to zero over, over a period of time. Now, in the case of uh, India, we are also now making grain-based whiskies. But our maturation time is much less because when you mature it, the whiskey in a white oak cask, our uh, loss by evaporation is 12% because of the heat. The loss in Scotland is 2%. So that is the kind of technicality. The Scotch Whiskey Association is saying that we can allow Indian whiskey to grain-based whiskey to come in, provided it is matured for three years. You can imagine the enormous loss that it would be caused. So these are some of the technicalities which we will have to get into. Uh, aircraft, uh, you know, parts, components, automobiles are very important for us and for the UK. And uh, steel, iron and steel has already been mentioned, aluminium, other metals like copper. London is uh, uh, at the hub of uh, the metals exchange. So a lot of deals take place through London. 
and uh, then uh, we have uh, pharmaceuticals where we have been exporting about 7 800 million dollars worth and they have also been exporting 2 300 million dollars but there is plenty of scope to scale it up because there are already companies which are operating on both sides uh, of the border so uh, that is one uh, major area of uh, cooperation and exploring opportunities to scale up uh, our business uh, energy and uh, renewable energy that is uh, something which again is of interest the uk has taken the lead in terms of research in terms of commercializing some of its uh, uh, you know inventions etc so that is another opportunity and as far as services is concerned i agree entirely with mr mohit saraf the uk is looking for not only uh, professional services in the shape of legal services educational services a large number of indians go to the uk to study and uh, they are uh, studying there on campus but the uk is also interested to open uh, branches uh, of their universities here or have online curricula provided the rules are made transparent and there is repatriation of profits uh, allowed which we do not allow at the moment so that is uh, something which you know we'll have to look into uh, asset management from a remote location that is well you know management that is another area in which the uk has a lot of expertise and Thank it you. wants us to open up thank you so much mr dasgupta for those inputs education is one important area has been needing transformation for a long time uh, it's difficult in this country uh, we will uh, shortly take it up uh, but that's not the end moving towards october we will get ample opportunities to take up sector specific issues it involves a large number of industrial stakeholders and it would be a pleasure to discuss it raise issues that industries have as the fta signed in the form of a legal document and of course we'll have our eminent panel again to discuss that but uh, that's it for now i would like to thank ambassador das gupta uh, okay one question if i may ask dr das gupta mr das gupta particularly i think the the specialized negotiating teams which the present commerce minister has brought in and experts do you see that will improve the quality of negotiation because i see that at least a big change and i was just because you have been part of the whole process uh, and, and and therefore your guidance on that will be very because really there are people specialized negotiator they only do negotiations and and now the commerce minister is also thinking like that so you would actually be able to balance the negotiating skills actually you know what happens is that uh... the commerce ministry is only the nodal ministry it takes an interministerial group for instance for finance uh, financial services negotiation there would be somebody from dea somebody from the reserve bank of india somebody also from the insurance industry for instance if there is something to be negotiated on telecom there would be somebody from the telecom ministry information technology ministry and the industry representatives who have a large stake in the business would also be there uh, at the you know venue of the negotiations to consult with uh, all the time you know for instance we had the uh, uh, process called the g4 in the wto negotiations india uh, brazil us and the eu were there and the industry groups were all present there who had uh, uh, you know uh, much at stake and they would uh, come and give us inputs that uh, happened at the bali ministerial meeting of the wto as well so i think increasingly this is a trend when industry feels that it has something to gain because barriers are coming down and exports are uh, something which will thank enable them to achieve thank, scale. thank you so much We're totally out of time but thank you so much for all these valuable inputs looking forward to discuss more in part 2 thank you all thank you so very much For more such videos subscribe to the Newsx YouTube channel hit the bell icon